Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Training Tidbits podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge from Animal Training Academy, and I'm extremely excited about having you here with us today and being back in your eardrums to talk all about best practice behavior management for what is set to be another amazing episode. I can't wait to dive in and learn all about today's guests and their learning odyssey. If you haven't checked out the past episodes yet, then make sure to head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and you can listen to them all there, or you can also find them on iTunes and slash or on Stitcher. There is definitely something there for absolutely everyone as well as some sensational up and coming episodes planned over the next wee while. Just before we do get started though, I want to say a massive thank you to everyone that listens to this podcast on a regular basis or maybe you are joining us for the first time ever. This show is so much fun to make and I get really inspired thinking about all the people that have benefited from all the wisdom our podcast guests have shared. Today's episode is, of course, going to be no exception to this. If you do like the episode today, then please share it as far and as wide as you possibly can. I also appreciate that a lot of you listen to the podcasts on apps from your mobile devices and smartphones. And so one thing you can do that would be really appreciated is navigate to the title of the podcast. And around there somewhere, you should be able to see three little dots. If you tap on this, it will open up a menu and one option in that menu is to share. So you can easily share this on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, Snapchat, or whatever social media network you might use. I would be extremely grateful if you could take a couple of seconds to do that. But we will get started on today's episode where I'm going to be talking to Anna the care, observation, and training of animals was a great passion in Anna's childhood. At the age of 12, she already participated in dog sporting competitions with various dogs and with her border colleague Flyer, 1998-2011. She achieved her first spectacular title with the full number of points in the open class. Several other titles followed in the coming years. As a dog trainer in various dog schools, she attended seminars, worked and studied at different veterinary and did an internship at Zoo Vienna. And she also worked as a dog trainer while going through high school. After many years of preparation for her first goal, the unique education in America's teaching zoo, Anna Ablasia Myrtle was admitted to the Moorpark College, California, immediately after graduating from high school. In the exotic animal training and management program, ETIM, at America's teaching zoo, Anna was part of a team for over 160 animals of 120 species. Anna also designed presentations such as educational shows, behavioral enrichment presentations, and trainer talks. As part of her training, she trained a sea lion, big cats, as well as other carnivores, primates, herbivores, and birds. During her second year of studies, she received the Megan Maureen Thomas Memorial Scholarship, a scholarship for particularly committed and successful students at Moorpark College. In order to learn more about behavioral modification in animals and to make the best use of time in the USA, she completed internships at Los Angeles Zoo, Santa Barbara Zoo, Guide Dogs for the Blind, Dolphin Quest Hawaii, and Wild Things Incorporated. As the first Austrian graduate of the established Eaton program, she is the only academically certified exotic animal trainer in Austria, as well as the first Austrian certified professional dog trainer trainer, CPDTKA, of the Certification Council for Professional Dog Trainers. Anna Oblasia Myrtle has acquired an excellent theoretical and practical basis in over 20 years of dog training and more than 13 years of exotic animal training. As a crossover trainer, a trainer who has worked with traditional methods before applying positive reinforcement, she has had enough time to gain invaluable experience with a variety of training methods. She can pass these experiences on to her employees other dog trainers and dog owners as part of the work of the Animal Training Center. Since the founding of the Animal Training Center in 2006, it has been continuing its annual activities in Austria and abroad and maintains close contact with trainers from all over the world and from all disciplines. Meanwhile, a large network has formed which contributes significantly to the further development of the ATC. Within the framework of the Animal Behavior Management Alliance Conference in San Francisco, Anna received the Impact Award, the most prestigious award in the industry for her lecture on implementing a zoo animal training program at an Austrian zoo. After years of trying to improve animal welfare in a zoo setting through operant conditioning in Europe. On top of this, she also won another ABMA award, the Behaviour Management Innovation Award for her lecture on diabetic alert dogs in 2015. So without 
further ado, it's my great pleasure to welcome one Anna Oblasia Myrtle to the show today. Anna, how are you? I'm great and I'm so excited to talk to you today. Thank you so much for having me as your guest. Uh, it's an absolute honor. I'm extremely excited to talk to you as well and can't wait for all the podcast listeners to learn from your years and years of experience. We'll dive straight in today, Anna, with the first question. We briefly mentioned this time of your life in the introduction, but could you please take us back to where you first learned about positive reinforcement animal training and some of the first animals you ever trained using it. That's a funny story because when I learned about positive reinforcement, I pretty much failed at my first trials and it became a pretty frustrating experience. So at first I read about it in a newspaper that was about 15 years ago. And at that time I worked at a traditional dog school here in Austria. So in that article, clicker training was mentioned and I was striving for more information and better results in dog training, especially when dealing with difficult dogs with behavioral problems. So I was eager to learn about it, but since there wasn't a lot of information available to me, I just started using the clicker to see if it would work. And I did manage to teach my dog some random tricks and thought, oh yeah, great, let's try that and we'll see what happens. So I wanted to implement the clicker into my dog training classes just to show people that there are you know, other training techniques and the ones that we were used to. But I guess the time wasn't quite ready yet and I wasn't allowed to do it. So due to a lack of more information on the science, backing up this new training technique, I finally gave up, but at the same time, I just wasn't comfortable with traditional methods anymore. So as new doors opened for me, I tried to learn more about positive reinforcement whenever I had a chance to. And even though people were laughing at me, my own dog's performance constantly improved and I won various titles, as you mentioned, especially with that one dog. And I was the young trained at all the competitions. I was about 15 years old. And yeah, even though at this point of my life, I've already known that I wanted to become a professional trainer. That's when I first realized that this kind of training is what I really want to do. Yeah, great story. And so wonderful. I love hearing about what I call people's behavioral odysseys. So thank you very much for sharing. For this next question, Anna, could you please explain for everyone listening a little bit about the Animal Training Center or the ATC, what it is, how it got started and share some stories from your experience setting this up. I've always wanted to be an animal trainer and I first read about the exotic animal training and management program in the United States in a magazine when I was probably around 10 years old. There was an article about Morper College and I showed it to my parents and told them that this is what I will be doing. So to be honest, I wasn't very excited about the exotics in this program at first. I just wanted to learn about training and utilize everything I was about to learn at Morper College in my dog training classes. And I had no idea that I would totally fall in love with exotic animal training too. So just two weeks after graduating from high school, I packed my boyfriend and my dog and we moved to the United States to California so I could learn more about the science of animal training. As some of your other guests have talked about before, Park College is an amazing place which provides tons of learning opportunities. And for me as an international student, I tried to gain as much information as I could, knowing that this is my chance to learn. And if I would go back to Austria, I seriously need to know what I'm doing since I wouldn't have a huge community backing me up over there. So over the time, while at Morpa College, it became a goal to spread the idea of positive reinforcement training and share my fascination about it. So I really wanted to go back to Europe because I felt like my work could be more helpful over here. While I was still at Park, I wrote a business plan and tried to find a way to do what I love to do, which is animal training, and make enough money to cover living expenses at the same time. And I assumed that my main business would be dog training at first. So I also became certified as a professional dog trainer before moving back home to Austria in 06. When I arrived back home, I wanted to take some time to adjust to living in Austria to set up my business and, you know, to rescue some animals so I could start my programs here. But then my aunt got me an interview at this big newspaper around here. And overnight, there were all these people calling me, wanting me to train their dogs and come to their schools and share my animals with them, which I didn't even have at that time. So I started to work as a trainer even before my business was set up or registered or anything. And it was a bit overwhelming at first. 
But thanks to that first article, I could start working as an animal trainer right at the beginning and I never had to take on another job to cover living expenses, which is pretty awesome for me. So I founded the ATC, offering a wide variety of training like professional dog training. And of course, it be, positive reinforcement became my primary focus doing that. And it was really important for me to please my clients' requests at the same time, because just doing positive reinforcement training and not getting any results won't work um, if that's what you're getting paid for. So besides the dog training, I also started wildlife education outreach programs, which was fun because I didn't even have any animals yet. And people started booking the shows and I had less than a week to go to get some animals ready to do a school program. And, you know, it all worked out. And I also learned that you don't necessarily need high profile animals to do fun shows. So you don't really need a sea lion or a fancy macaw or any really exotic animals to share the message. So I learned how to do exciting shows and get the audience involved and be active about protecting animals in the wild and also the habitats when I could really only bring a dog and a bunny and two chickens and cockroaches and there was a rat too. So these were my animals that I was supposed to do an amazing show with. <laughs> and it was a lot of fun learning how to deal with that situation because that was pretty new to me because when I did the shows at Moore Park, I had all these amazing high profile animals. To show. So at the same time, I also started offering zoo animal training consulting services, which is a whole different story. And I didn't even get my first job until a couple of years later because zoos in Austria didn't quite understand the benefits of animal training at that time. And we also started doing some TV and movie training because the media just loves it. And I needed a lot of attention from the media to advertise my business. For me, that's a tricky business to deal with since for me, the animals always come first and very often on set, they are not first. So I learned my lesson the hard way. And very soon I realized that I have to be extremely careful about what jobs to do and which ones don't meet the standards that I want to have for my animals. These days we are doing much better. One of my trainers is an experienced movie trainer and she does a way better job than I did. So we are back to doing a little more movie training and the animals actually love it since now we are skilled enough and I guess we are able to make the right decisions for them. So SDATC became a successful company within a pretty short period of time. Over the years we also started doing seminars seminars like the chicken training camps, which I love, and many other workshops, you know, everything including dog training and all the, the problem solving that comes with it, no matter if it's resource guarding or stress management, basically anything that improves the lives of dogs and the owners, of course. <laughs> So over the years, we've also started to train our own dog trainers. We have about five of them now. They all have their own business in a franchise system. And they all do an amazing job teaching dog owners about their best friends and help them to understand each other. We often see how little dog owners know about the dog's body language or their basic needs. And in order to train a dog and avoid behavior problems, I think it's just crucial that you know more about the species that you live with. So we often have dog owners call us and they say, I don't want my dog to do anything special. We just need some loose leash walking, a nice recall. It should stay at home while I'm at work for eight hours and it should get along with my toddler. Well, actually, I think that's a lot that we are asking for. And if we take it as granted that our dogs adjust to our lifestyle, we won't be very successful because it's a learning process, right? So I guess we tend to forget about our dog's own needs and we tend to label them and they're dogs not humans so if we want to understand them we have to invest time and energy in order to train them and be well-behaved pets and then a couple of years ago we also started a very successful diabetic alert dog program which has shown me that we can reach more than we can ever imagine but i guess we can talk about it later and one of our dedicated trainers barbara glatz does some great projects in africa at a rehab facility called makoa farm it's at the slope of the kilimanjaro mountain and she went there to set up a wildlife education program for underprivileged children. And she also trains rescued animals for release. And she implemented positive reinforcement training techniques into the training program of the Tanzanian uh, police dog and horse units. And she also tried to improve the animal care standards. So when she started doing these internships, 
couple of years ago, she really got into <laughs> kind of the same state of mood that I was in. We just have to share that message. So finally, last year, she moved to the United Kingdom, where she now has her own ATC. And she does um, zoo animal training, consulting, and dog training over there. So that's our first international branch. That's really exciting. Yeah. And, and I'm mentioning this to you before the podcast, but the amount that you have achieved in the time frame that you have achieved it and the growth of ATC is equally impressive. It's very cool to learn about. Just a couple more things on this before we move on to the next question. I really liked your story about your drive and, and your passion to, to learn more information. What, what did your parents say when you said, mum and dad, I'm going to America and I'm, I'm going to attend Moore Park College? Well, the, the first thing was, who's going to pay for that? <laughs> <laughs> And figured it out somehow. And, you know, I was a child, so nobody would really think that I was serious about it. And it was just the dream of a little girl to become an animal trainer. But then I became successful doing the dog sports. And I guess people kind of saw that I lost my interest in everything else, including school, and just totally focused on dog training. So I wouldn't do anything else but dog training. I would skip school. Like all the weekends, I would spend at the dog school um, doing competitions and stuff like that. And I'm really thankful that my parents trusted me enough to spend all that money and send me to the United States to become an animal trainer, which is such an exotic profession over here. Yeah, and they, I guess they believed in me. And even though we had no idea at this point about, you know, what I would do after graduation, they, yeah, they believed in me and they supported me. And they've been supporting me ever since. So when we came home from the United States, we moved back in with my mom. And well, it wasn't the plan to get a lot of animals, but as I told you, I needed I needed all of them. So all of a the sudden, there were like 30 animals all over my mom's house and in her backyard, just reindeer in her backyard. And um, <laughs> it was, yeah, it was, a, it was pretty crazy. And, you know, they were protesting. I mean, their parents always have to say no. So <laughs> right in the beginning, when I was trying to tell them that I need cockroaches for my outreach program, <laughs> She definitely said no. And then I got them anyway because I needed them. And then, to, you know, to make him friends, I guess, I just put them in her kitchen cabinet. So she opened it and there was this huge cockroach <laughs> sitting there and she was freaking out. But then, you know, she was open and I told her about how amazing these animals are and that these cockroaches would be ambassadors <laughs> for this species and for our ecosystems and for saving Madagascar and, <laughs> and like all the other messages these cockroaches share with us. Um, so she fell in love with them and actually one is named after her because she adopted her <laughs> um, so we always have a cockroach that's named after my mother <laughs> maybe maybe if she had that information before you first said you wanted to go to more park <laughs> right. that one day you would have a cockroach named after you <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, that's great hey just for everyone listening Anna that is wanting to get into animal training and doesn't really know where to start or what to do? What kind of advice can you give to these people? I advise doing tons of internship at, uh, internships at different places because, you know, I wasn't sure if I would want to be an animal trainer or a vet or a groomer. I just knew that I wanted to work with animals. So during high school, I started doing all these internships and I was a keeper and I worked at the vet and all these different things. And that experience helped me to find my way and to see where my way is going to lead me to, which was definitely animal training. Does the ATC do internships? Yes, we do. Um, our interns are a huge part of our animal care and training team. So these are the ones who usually get to be at the farm, be with the animals, spend all the time with the animals. That's kind of what we want to do as trainers too. But then, you know, we get so busy and we, we just have to do our work. So very often we we're kind of jealous <laughs> that our interns get to hang out with our animals because we love them. And yeah, so if anybody wants to do an internship in Austria, you're more than welcome to. Cool. And so just before we move on to the next question, one last thing, where can people go to find out more information about that and about the Animal Training Centre? Well, we have a website. We used to have one in English too, but with all the adjustments we made, we just couldn't keep up with the, with the translations. So I guess there is this website, animaltrainingcenter.at, and we also have a Facebook fan site, which is really active. So if you want to find out more about us, Facebook would definitely be a place to go. And if you go to Google Chrome and you put your website in, and there's actually an, an extension you can add to Google Chrome that will translate the entire thing. So I'm in 
managed to view your entire website cool. in English. Yeah, that's awesome. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank you so much for sharing. That was a lot of fun to learn about. For our next question, I was wondering if we could please discuss a book that you have had published. And this book is all about medical training for dogs. Can you tell us a little bit more about this book, the inspiration for writing it, and maybe share some advice for our listeners who are interested in doing medical training with their dogs? A couple of years ago, I watched an episode of a famous American dog trainer, actually the dog whisperer, who tried to clip a dog's nails. And the dog was completely terrified and screaming, growling and trying to bite. And finally, the trainer wrestled the muscled dog to the ground, holding him down with his full body weight and trying to clip his nails. So it broke my heart to watch that. And I started to look for YouTube videos of dogs at the vet. And I was completely shocked when I saw all those videos of fearful, scared dogs that had the worst time of their lives. So I started wondering why we train zoo animals to participate in their own care and the medical procedures, while we train dogs to jump over hurdles and compete in obedience and train them to guide blind people around the city. But when it comes to their own medical care, we usually just restrain them and force them into situations where they're scared and don't even know what's going on at all. And we think that's completely okay. Well, actually, we don't even really think about it. But I think that our dogs give us so much. So I thought it was time to give back to them. And we started to put a lot of time into spreading the idea of doing husbandry and medical training with pet dogs. So basically just using the training techniques that we're familiar with from zoo animal training in our own homes with our pet dogs. And it turned out that the dogs love medical training. So at the ATC, it all started with a dog named Joey and his owner, who is now one of my trainers, rescued Troy from a shelter in Greece. And he was really scared of people at first, hiding under the kitchen table for like three days when she got him. And he would let people know when they were too close to him. So after that appointment, he ended up on the list of potentially dangerous dogs who were only seen by a vet if they would wear muscle. So Elke started medical training and within three weeks of training, the vet was able to draw blood without any restraint at all. And Troy would just stay on his mark and present his paw to the vet so he could walk up to his leg and draw blood from there. And if Troy would leave the mark, we would stop the procedure. But at the same time, reinforcement would stop. And then we would make it easier for the dog. And when he would come back, reinforcement would continue. And to make that concept more understandable for pet owners, we named it the I am ready signal. And it doesn't matter what it is. This can be a mark for a blood draw or a chin rest to the eye drops or ear cleaning or laying on the side for x-rays or even pre just presenting the paw for nail clipping. It can be so easy. So after that short training time with Joey, when he just stood on his mark and watched how the vet drew blood from his vein, it totally changed our whole world. And we decided to write a book about medical training for dogs. And what I love about the book is that it has little links in it, which leads you to training videos. So you can not only read about it, but you can also so watch us train these behaviors. It also has training plans in it, so it's kind of easy to follow the training steps if you have a little bit of experience. And yeah, it turns out that people like the book, so it will be translated into English soon. And we are working on a DVD, which will also be available in English, hopefully pretty soon. Fantastic. I can't wait for it to be available in the English. <laughs> I'll pre order my copy now. I, I really like the idea of using what we do in zoos with our dogs uh, and, and the logic behind that and the illogic of not doing it. Maybe just build upon something you mentioned there with regards to placing labels upon this animal. It was classified unworkable or aggressive and with some people without your experience and knowledge that might have potentially put this animal in a, in a space where we couldn't work with it because of this reason so when it comes to labeling i love to invite people to do a chicken camp because at a chicken camp you get to train a chicken that you don't know at all. So you basically can't put a label on that chicken. And there are 11 other people training their own chicken and they've never met the chicken before and you don't know which one you get assigned to or you can actually pick the chicken that you would want to train. But I found out that attending a chicken camp really makes people think about labeling their own dogs and pets. And it's really not about that stubborn dog or even, you know, oh, that sad little rescued dog, he can't learn and 
we can't get him to do a blood draw, a voluntary blood draw, because we can. We should just stop labeling the animals and look at what we have and look at what the animal gives us and go from there. I like it. And just before we move on, you mentioned a couple of videos that are linked to in that book. Are there any videos you have of, was it Joey? Yeah. That you would be comfortable sharing on the write-up of this podcast? Oh, are definitely. They... Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So all of you out there listening can see what happened when the label was removed in the space of <laughs> three right. weeks. <laughs> so great. And for now, we'll put a link to the book on Amazon. And as Anna said, it will be available in English soon. Is that the best thing to do, Anna? Oh, if it, it's okay. Of course. I'd love you to do that. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. So if you can, uh, what language is it in currently? Right now it's in German. Okay. So if you speak German and you can read German, make sure you get your hands on that. And I'll keep you updated as well uh, when that does become available in English. Because I know there's a lot of people that are going to be really interested uh, in this book. Now for our next question, Anna, I'm really excited to hear about your experiences here because I wanted to talk about training diabetic warning dogs can you please tell everyone listening a little bit about what this is and how it all works i obviously like a lot of different training areas no matter if it's zoo animal training or studio work or wildlife education but somehow i always wanted to make a bigger impact by training animals and after doing an internship at guide dogs for the blind in california i never forgot about these amazing assistance dogs and how they improve their owners lives so about six years ago, a desperate mom called me and her son had type 1 diabetes and his blood sugar levels were really hard to predict and control. So she heard about these diabetic alert dogs and asked me if we could train one for her son. Well, I said, I'll do my research and find out more about it. So I went back to the United States and some trainers taught me a lot about scent training for medical alerts. And at the same time, we had a donated litter of puppies and we decided to go for it and give it a try. So the first dog we trained, her name was Nayeli, and she's been with the little boy who is actually not that little anymore for almost five years. And she's a great dog and doing that training and seeing how it changes the lives of the diabetics and their families just really got us into training these fantastic dogs. So we've been developing and improving our program over the last years and have successfully placed about 40 dogs in Austria, Germany, and the United States. And in Austria, there are very advanced protocols regarding assistance dog certifications through the state of Austria, just to avoid scams, which are quite common in the assistance dog world. And also to try to avoid pets being labeled as assistance dogs, which quite a few pet owners do in order to bring their dogs on airplanes into hotels and, you know, take advantage of all the benefits that are really made for assistance dogs and not pets, just because these people who own assistance since dogs actually need their dogs. So we've worked on these certifications for a couple of years and every assistance dog that meets the health and training requirements can now be certified through the state. And as of today, we've placed about 40 uh, diabetic alert dogs and 31 of them are already certified and have full access to all buildings, including hospitals. And yeah, we just love the project and all the challenges that come up during training. And it's definitely one of my favorite projects. Yeah, cool. And what behaviors do the dogs do? So can you explain a little bit more about what a, a diabetic warning dog actually does? So they do quite a bit of stuff. It's really important for them to have very good obedience and manners. And it's great when those manners work at home and the dog behaves well at home, but these dogs need to behave wherever they are and you never know what situations they run into. So we do a lot of public access training too. And dog specifics, um, they all learn how they're. So sometimes people in a low blood sugar, they can't remember where their meter is or they're too confused to find it. So the dogs can go and find it and bring it to them and actually put it in their hands so they don't even have to, you know, go get it. And then the most important thing we train them is the alert. So they're alert to high and low blood sugar. And we teach our dogs for different behaviors to alert. So the dogs can actually choose which one is the right alert in whatever situation. So these four alerts are fetching the bringsle, pawing our leg, barking, or ringing a bell, which later can be used as an emergency bell connecting the diabetic's bedroom with the parent's bedroom or the neighbors or whoever is ready to help. And 
we also teach the dogs to pick the right alerting behavior for every situation. So when I'm at the university with my dog and I'm listening to a lecture, it would be kind of embarrassing or interrupting if my dog starts barking. So that's when he should really use his paw to get our attention. But then when he rides in the car, in the back of the car, it doesn't help at all if he fetches the brinksel or tries to paw me. So he needs to bark. So that's a big thing that we teach our dogs so they can decide which alert is going to be the appropriate and most helpful one in that situation. And what kind of <laughs> stimuli are the dogs looking for to alert them to do mm-hmm. behaviors? It all works with the scent. So it seems like high and low blood sugar smells which we as humans can't really smell, or if we can, it's way too late. And we really don't know what it is. There's no research on it. We just work with saliva samples that we take from the diabetics when they have a blood sugar of 75, which is not really low blood sugar yet, but it's definitely a blood sugar level where where you as a diabetic would like to know what's going on just in order to take care of yourself so you actually don't slip into a low blood sugar. And it's amazing how the dog's nose it's incredible. They, they, If you teach them to alert at 75, they will alert at 75. Maybe at 76, but they know when 75 happens. So I think we have no idea how amazing these noses are. Yeah, I was wondering if it was all scent-based and it's exciting. It is, as you say, just so amazing what that nose can do. I think this might be one of the favorite things I've had the pleasure of discussing on this show so far. Very (laughs) inspirational. Hey, thank you so much for sharing, Anna. Sadly, we are nearly at the end, but that's okay because we're heading into one of my favorite parts of the podcast, and this is story time. Anna, can you please share with everyone listening two or three stories from your experience training animals so far and some of the important lessons you've learned along the way? I'd love to. So taking the sea lion, I got to train at Moorpark College. I know (laughs) some of your guests have already talked about that one sea lion. She's really special. And we got to take her to the ocean to swim with her. And that was an amazing experience and just made a huge impact on me. It was amazing to see that this intelligent wild animal decided to stay with us. And she completely trusted us. She was really old at that time and also blind. And she could have just taken off, but she decided to stay here and trust us and that she wanted to be with us and also that she was fine with going back to the zoo which at the same time meant that she was well taken care of and that we are kind of her family so having that kind of a relationship with a wild animal made a big impression on me and it gives me the motivation to start all the projects we work on even though they're sometimes a little crazy and well I love my job because every day is different I you never know what's coming up the next day and these can be heartbreaking events that I had to learn how to deal with like when animals that you love and you're very connected with and you share your house with pass away or on the positive side a new door opens when a mother of a diabetic calls you for help and even though I don't realize that my world has just completely changed but I don't find out until years later when I talk to these parents again and this time their eyes don't fill with tears because they are devastated but they're so thankful and happy that their family's lives have improved so much just because of a dog that you raised and trained for them. And I get calls from families who are on vacation in another country, and they're so excited because their dog, who actually stayed at home in Austria, just did a remote alert. So the dog alerted to high or low blood sugar, even though the diabetic was hundreds of kilometers away from the dog. And the dog was right. The dogs are always right. And I don't even know how this works. It's it's just an amazing experience when we get these cars and it's not coincidences it it really does work and it's nothing that we train them they just start to do remote alerts on their own so these remote alerts are a perfect example for me how there are no limits in positive reinforcement based training and the only limit is our imagination i love that and i think you've just came up with the title for this podcast episode no limits (laughs) (laughs) the only limit is our imagination i can imagine how reinforcing that must be for you to receive those phone calls from those mothers. Yeah, we do cry a lot in our office. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it gets me excited to think about animal, the animal training center and what's going to be next. Your whole life could change tomorrow <laughs> when someone <laughs> right. brings you up. You never know. Idea. So great. And of course, 
those stories and lessons were fantastic for us all to learn from. Sadly, though, this does bring us now to our final question for this episode, Anna. Could you please now take us all into the future and share with us what you would like to see happen over the next five to ten years in the animal training world? In the dog training world, I'd love to see more dog owners actually doing their research on training techniques as well as the trainers they choose to ask for support and that they don't believe everything they see on TV. In Austria, we are happy to have very high and advanced standards regarding dog training equipment and training techniques. So using electronic devices such as spray collars or shock collars or prong collars or even choke chains are prohibited by law. And of course, that doesn't mean that nobody uses that equipment, but at least there's a huge shift in the right direction. From a trainer side, I think I'd like trainers to focus on primary reasons for training which are behaviors that the animal benefits from directly and that we realize or that we help people realize that training is something that the animals enjoy and that they benefit from if it's done correctly. And from the exotic animal trainer side, I think we need to communicate with the public about how and why we train more than we used to do. And I always ask myself, why does the public love the dog whisperer, who in my opinion does some horrible things to the dogs and has very little understanding about dog behavior or training? But at the same time, people get, the same people get really into fighting against SeaWorld where they do provide high quality training. And I feel like we have to explain what we are doing when it comes to training, especially after all of the debates that came up after the movie Blackfish. Yeah, I also, you know, when talking to the public, we have to be cautious about the terminology we use when we present training and talk about keeping animals in human care. I would like couch activists to understand what we are doing and what's happening out there in the real world so they can focus on saving our planet instead of fighting for the hopeless release of killer whales who are probably very t well taken care of anyway. And I think it's important that people understand the difference between animal rights and animal welfare because it does make a huge difference. And I've seen it recently a lot and I love it. And I'm talking about the shift to respectful handling and training of small animals that are being used in educational programs. So, you know, it gives us the right to just pull an armadillo out of its den when it's time to do a show. Nobody would do that with a potentially dangerous animal and it wouldn't be accepted to do that with many larger species. So it's extremely important for me to treat all animals with respect, no matter how little they are and if they could hurt us or not. Ken Ramirez's killer whale rule, which is all about respectful training and handling with the focus on avoiding frustration. Such great vision. And we, of course, are all working really hard to do what we can to make, make help these things transpire as we move forward over the coming years. As mentioned, that does sadly bring us to the end. But before we do wrap up, from myself and on behalf of everyone listening, Anna, a ton of Animal Training Academy gratitude to you for making time to come on the show today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me as a guest. Absolute pleasure. We do, of course, really appreciate all of you out there tuning in today as well. And we hope that you enjoyed listening to this podcast as much as we enjoyed making it. I want to ask a small favor of those listening. If you do enjoy these podcasts and as a practitioner of best practice behavior management yourself, you feel that the information held within could help others, then please share this episode wherever you can. On Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Pinterest, Snapchat, whatever you use, so that as a community, we can do absolutely everything within our power to disseminate this information as far and as wide as possible. And one really easy way to do this, as mentioned at the start of the episode, if you're listening to it from a podcast app on your mobile device or smartphone, there should be three little dots next to the title of the episode. Now, this might change slightly between devices and depending upon what app you're using. But if you click on this, there will be an option to share the episode and you can choose Facebook, email, how, however you want to share it. And it's done really simple. Take your 30 seconds. If you could do this, that would be super. That's it for this episode, though. We'll wrap it up there. Thanks again so much for listening. For now, though, we have to go, Buffalo. You'll be hearing from us again soon. Cheers. Bye. Bye.